Thank you very much. I was momentarily uh, uh, stymied because I was writing an extra note on the, on the theme of inclusivity uh, as a result of that. But uh, um, I need to apologise uh, just before I start for, for two things. Uh, the, the first is that um, I've noticed in the uh, programme for today that, that the conference starts, you then have me, and then you immediately break for refreshments, which I assume is to allow you to go off and get a stiff, bracing drink, which kind of appeals to me. I like that. That, that seems quite good. The other thing to apologise for is I'm basically going to give you the standard lecture. And I do that for a couple of reasons. I don't do it only to save effort although that's a tiny bit of it. I also do it because I think it's important to be consistent in your message. So more or less, I'll be sti sticking to the same script that I've given uh, in public lectures to the general public, to uh, training committees for psychiatry, to general practitioners, uh, to public health physicians, to clinical psychologists, and, and to others. Um, so I haven't bended it or transformed it significantly particularly for today, but I think the messages are uh, pretty much the same. And just to, to take Dave's point about inclusivity, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about the issue of diagnosis, I'm going to talk about the issue of, of inclusivity, and I suppose one of my messages, which I'm going to come round to at the end, is that there is really only us, the divisions between people in terms of well and ill, between patients and the general public, between those of us who do or don't have supposed mental health problems or disorders, I think are fallacious distinctions. I think there is only uh, the science of psychology that applies to us as human beings, so I don't believe that there is, in fact, abnormal psychology at all. Uh, I think there is only psychology, and therefore within that, distinctions between child and educational psychology versus clinical psychology uh, are very low on my list of, of things I would take very seriously. Uh, right, so get started. Well, as Dave says, you know, this is a talk around this book, and it's around this book for, again, very simple reasons, which is I, I tried to say what I believe, and so I, so I prepared this. I was aware at the time that I was winding up psychiatrists, and it's true that I've got a brass neck. I just thought it would be more entertaining to do something amusing than to do something bland. So there we go. And my publishers were obviously very keen on the idea because they went for the pill bottle, which I think is a stroke of genius. That's the cover of the book. Um, the also the other thing to say is that I cover these, these topics elsewhere. I'm particularly proud of this. If those of you who are into the academic world uh, want to emulate this, at the moment that this online course with an organisation called FutureLearn uh, went live, the number of people studying courses at the University of Liverpool doubled. I had more p learners on this course than there were people otherwise enrolled at the University of Liverpool on all of their educational courses. Uh, so far, 77,000 people have taken the course. So if you want to get the message out there, do free online courses for the general public. It's quite fun, um, apart from the video making, which is embarrassing. Um, so kind of what's it all about? Well, when the... When the Click again. There we go. So one thing to say is I don't think I'm picking fights. I think that I'm responding to challenges that other people have laid down. So uh, I don't think I'm in the business of, of pointing out uh, issues that other people haven't already tried to grapple with. This is a quote from the Schizophrenia Commission, which was set up by Rethink, uh, Rethink Mental Illness, the charity, uh, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and chaired by uh, Robin Murray. Uh, Professor Sir Robin, Robin Murray, uh, former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and if I'm quoting their words out of context, my defence is they shouldn't have put them in that context. But the Schizophrenia Commission concluded the message that comes through loud and clear is that people are being badly let down by the system in every area of their lives, and I think we should put that right. The question is, how do we do it? And again, I don't think I'm picking fights, and I'm particularly not fighting guild wars, because when you look at uh, psychiatry, when this clicker works. This is, uh, these are two, uh, in a sense, editorials from the British Journal of Psychiatry, the first in 2008 and the second in 2012, both by large numbers of eminent uh, British uh, practicing psychiatrists, both of them arguing in their own way that something dramatic needs to change in the field of mental health care. Um, uh, Nick Craddock and his colleagues uh, on the one nearest to me, the wake-up call for British psychiatry in 2008, argued passionately that psychiatry was losing its ground in Britain as a profession, 
and losing its uh, ability to claim authority with the public and losing, most importantly, and genuinely most importantly for him, and I respect him for this, losing the ability to help people in trouble because it was moving away from its biomedical roots. They, they argued very powerfully in this uh, paper that what we needed to do was re-establish psychiatry as a branch of medicine to understand the workings of the brain and how when the brain goes wrong, people develop mental illnesses. And it argued that people should not be, which is not, I think, an unreasonable paraphrase of the paper, fobbed off with psychosocial interventions when they've got serious illnesses that need the attention of a consultant physician. Four years later, because it takes us a while to get things published, uh, Pat Bracken and uh, uh, Sammy Tamimi and others uh, wrote a very similar article, again published as a special article in British Psychiatry, which is why I parallel them, again arguing that psychiatry is going powerfully wrong, again arguing that people are being let down, and again arguing that dramatic change is needed, that psychiatry needed, in their words, to move beyond the current paradigm. But they argued exactly the opposite to uh, Craddock and colleagues. They argued that psychiatry was not a science of the brain, that it was not the same as any other branch of, of medicine, and that essentially they were physicians using their skills to work in the area of uh, social threat and social phenomena. So my point is, you know, obviously, I think it's pretty clear, by the end of this talk you'll realise that I agree a lot more with Pat Bracken than I do with Nick Craddock for all sorts of reasons, although I don't agree with everything that they say in this article. Uh, and actually, one of, the, one of the things is myself and Sam Thompson wrote a rejoinder to it that was published by the British Psychi Journal of Psychiatry as Get Your Tanks Off Our Lawn, which I thought was equally uh, robust. Um, but the point is that what you have is you have people within the system saying the system is broken, and then people within the profession of psychiatry having completely different points of view as to how it sh uh, should be solved. And my point is, I'm not suggesting there's a problem Everybody knows there's a problem, and I'm not creating a guild war, even though I do agree with some people more than I agree with others. But that's defence. So, so I thought, you know, what I'd do is I'd set out what I believe. And so, just in the grand tradition of academia, because I'm a professor after all, I shall tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell you it, and then I'll tell you what I've told you, okay? So this is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to maintain that mental health problems are fundamentally social and psychological issues. Uh, and one of the things I point out is that that's a reversal of the current uh, paradigm. The current paradigm, the biopsychosocial model as it's currently used, suggests that mental health problems are fundamentally medical issues which have social and psychological aspects. And I'm going to maintain that mental health problems are fundamentally social and psychological problems which might have biomedical aspects. It's reversing that, that equation. And because of that, I think that, as I say, I don't think there's abnormal psychology as much as I don't think there are abnormal disorders. But we should replace diagnoses, the use of diagnoses, with straightforward descriptions of people's problems. We should radically reduce the use of medication and use it pragmatically rather than suggesting it's a treatment for an underlying condition. And instead, and this is what psychologists would refer to as formulations, we need to understand how each person has learned to make sense of the world and tailor the help that we have to their unique and complex needs. We need to offer care rather than coercion, but beyond that, we need to establish the social prerequisites for genuine mental health and well-being. So that's what I'm going to say, and I'll go through the argument as to uh, why that's a good idea. I probably should point it in that direction, shouldn't I? There we go. So first of all, mental health problems are fundamentally social and psychological issues. And I have to say that this is the majority of what I'm going to argue. The rest of it, I think, follows logically from this premise. And it's here, because I'm an academic, that I put most of my weight. So first of all, take the, the contrary view. So Eric Kandel, Nobel Prize winner, looked at the way in which the brain operates in order to record memories. And uh, uh, author of a very influential paper called A New Intellectual Framework for Psychiatry back in 1989. And he argued that all mental processes, even the most complex psychological processes, derive from operations of the brain. And a very influential Tom Insel, until recently director of the National Institute for Mental Health in the US, and now a roving employee for Google, I should at this point uh, declare a conflict of interest in that I own a single share in Google. Uh, my son, when he did well in his GCSEs, we promised him fantastic levels of cash, you know, 10 pound for every A, and then 100 pound for every A, and then a car for every A, and then he got quite a lot of A's. So we thought, mm, how are we going to actually reward him for this? So we, we paid 380 quid, and I bought a, a share in Google. So I own a share in Google, which has actually gone up in value since I bought it, which is quite nice, a single share. Uh, but anyway, 
So, so every time you use Google, you are in fact contributing to the, anyway. Um, it's quite it's interesting being a capitalist. It's, it's amusing to me. Um, uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, the point is that Tom Insel has gone to work for Google, and a lot of people are very worried about this because he's a very biomedical psychiatrist by background, and it, it, there's some worries about what mass screening of the population might lead to. Part of the theme behind today, I think, and what happens when large numbers of people are identified as having what, in my opinion, are non-existent illnesses and then treated for them. We're into scary territory. Anyway. The point is that Kandel and, and Insel agree on this idea that all mental processes, even the most complex, uh, derive from operations of the brain. What's interesting about this is that in their papers, the argument is made that because every function of human beings is you know, consequent upon functions of the brain, that therefore the best way to understand mental health problems is as dis disorders of the brain. A, a moment's thought renders that to be a fallacious argument, a trivia, either trivial or wrong. And it's trivial or wrong because even in Kandel's paper, he says that every poem that has ever been written derives from functioning of the brain. Well, I think he's right. I don't think that human beings, even standing up here right now, I'm pretty sure, sorry to disappoint people, but I don't think with any organ other than my brain. That's just not true. And therefore, everything that I've ever done is a function of my brain. So if Eric Kandel is arguing that mental health problems should be understood as disorders of the fun physical functioning of the brain, because everything we do is a consequence of the physical functioning of the brain, then clearly uh, McGonagall's poem of the disaster on the Tay Bridge is a consequence of dis disordered functioning of his brain, and we should regard bad poetry as a form of mental illness. We should regard inappropriate choice of the colour of a, of a carpet in a convention centre as a, some sort of mental disorder, some sort of brain disorder. If everything that we do is a function of the disorder of the brain, why are we sectioning out mental health problems as being something to do with the physical functioning of the brain? But the other point about it is, it doesn't make sense from a logical point of view. Uh, one of the things to, to point out is that as I've argued in this, in this blog piece, that mental health is this complex interactive dance of nature and nurture. So none of us, I think, argue that we are free from our biological past. Again, I'd make the point that that's true of everything that we do. When I choose to wear a burgundy tie, it's the functions of my brain that are involved in the choice to make a burgundy tie. But it doesn't make philosophical sense to say that my brain or a disorder of my brain is responsible for the the colour choice of my tie. Human beings are learning and they're using their brain. So the way that I think of it is very much in terms of the brain being the organ with which we think, but the reasons why we think in the way that we do are much more complicated than just being a one-to-one -one consequence of the functioning of the brain. I need to put it that way. And this is a bit of a naff set of equations, but one of the ways that we can think of it is in terms of our psychological functioning being a consequence of both genes and environment, classic thing. But I think when we're talking about the sorts of issues that we're discussing today, we're talking about differences between people, either differences between how I am now and how I would like to be, differences between how I am today and how I was yesterday, or differences between how I am and how you are. And then the question is a rather more interesting one, which is to what, not to what extent is my mood or my thoughts or my behaviour a product of the brain, I think it's all a product of the brain, but to what extent can I characterise the differences between my emotional and cognitive functioning and your emotional and cognitive functioning, or indeed my functioning today with my functioning yesterday, in terms of either changes in the biology or differences in the biology or differences in learning. And my contention is that the differences between people in terms of their mental health issues are very little explained by differences between people in terms of their biological functioning and very much determined by differences between people in terms of their learning experiences and the way that they've responded. And the important point here is that this does not say that our emotions are a brain-free zone. What it says is that we all use our biological brains to make sense of the world and we all respond emotionally to the things that happen to us. And in all of us, it's our brains doing it. But in the same way that our brains respond differently to different situations because of our learning in other areas of life, that's true in the area of uh, emotions as well. Um, 
before explaining this, I'll just point out that one of the versions of this, which I, I was unsure what was going to be the next slide, uh, I gave in Norway, and I used the example in Norway that, that my talk, they'd asked for a copy of my talk beforehand, and they translated it into Norwegian. And I pointed out that everybody in the room was using their brains to understand language, and that if my brains had not developed, if my brain had not developed appropriately, and if the audience's brain had not developed appropriately, we wouldn't be able to understand the language. But the decision as to whether, or the fact as to whether I spoke in English or they spoke in Norwegian is not down to differences between the audience brain and mine, it's down to the way in which we were brought up. So in both cases, our use of language is dependent on our brain. It's our brain, our language areas, the physical functioning of the brain that determines our capacity to understand language. Whether we understand Norwegian or whether we understand English is a matter of learning. And similarly, if you evaluate yourself as being a successful person with much to be proud of, then I think that's a consequence of your brain working in the way that it should work in order to make sense of the world. If you happen to evaluate yourself as being worthless and condemned to a life of misery, then I think your brain is also doing what your brain is designed to do. It's just coming to a rather unfortunate consequence. So I put all of this together in this sort of a model, and one of the things that you'll see in it is that it suggests that psychological processes are at the heart of understanding mental health issues. The consequence of that, I think, is, is in part that we've got to uh, realise how the brain learns, but I think it's also a way of incorporating biological messages into a, a dominant psychological paradigm. Um, one of the things that, that you come across every so often is, is bits of evidence like this, that neuroscientists are probing the idea that interstitial microbiota might influence brain development and behaviour. And when you read these articles, what seems to happen is that people are, again, taking a very... Um, deterministic approach. Uh, I joked earlier that after my talk people would go off and have a stiff drink. I suspect that I will drink alcohol this evening. It's not 100% guaranteed but it's quite likely and if I do it will affect my brain. The idea that psychoactive substances affect our brain is kind of hardly news. I'm not particularly surprised that um, gut microbiota might affect brain development. It's, it doesn't really affect me a great deal. Uh, in both senses of the word. Um, but for me, what's interesting is the consequence of that. So for me, biological factors have their effect on us if they affect the way in which we process information. So uh, both in terms of mental health and also in terms of the well-being of children, what matters to me is whether biological factors influence the way in which we process information, influence the way in which we make sense of the world, influence the way in which we are capable of, or in fact do, uh, process information about... Uh, issues to do with emotion control, uh, perception, memory and so forth. Uh, I think that's clearly true in the case of uh, problems for children. I think it's also true for people with very serious mental health problems. A good example of that from my own area is uh, a guy called Tim Crow, uh, professor of psychiatry at Oxford until he retired and therefore probably not a stupid man, uh, was arguing about the biological basis of so-called schizophrenia. and. The story there seems to be quite interesting. Is first of all, when you throw away the diagnosis of schizophrenia, you're left with people with very serious problems that can very badly affect their lives, such as auditory hallucinations. And one of the questions would be, how is it, why is it that people uh, hear auditory hallucinations? And most importantly, why do some people have that experience and other people don't? Well, as I'll come on to say in a minute, one of the reasons is that there's quite a lot of evidence that poverty, racial discrimination, abuse, and especially sexual abuse in childhood, especially when coupled with a process of, of uh, depersonalization or dissociation, uh, tends to uh, lead to uh, psychosis, tends to lead to uh, hearing voices. But also there's another link, which is that what's going on for people is that they're mistaking either flashbacks or memories or, or intrusive thoughts as coming from outside. What Tim Crow was looking at is whether there are genetic abnormalities, I guess, but genetic variants that seem to predispose people to hear voices, and he found that there probably were, and that these genetic variants were associated with those parts of the brain that are responsible for language uh, production and language reception, 
that they were to do with the degree to which the brain of people lateralizes as they, you go through neural development. And what he basically found was that there was a link that goes from genetic abnormalities through the lateralization of the brain, especially the lateralization of language areas, to people who had poorly lateralized language areas who were more likely to experience intrusive thoughts or emotional flashback memories as auditory hallucinations. And all of that makes perfect sense. Because it, of course, is our brain that includes the mechanism with which we tell the difference between things that are happening inside our head and things that are happening outside. My point is that it's still a psychological process. What doesn't happen is that you have a poorly lateralized brain and then suddenly, out of nowhere, you get these disembodied phenomena called hallucinations. The people are still trying to make sense of the world. They're having experiences, they're trying to work out what's happening, and the biological factors behind their experiences are part of the story. I think it's also worth pointing out that we have considerable evidence that uh, the social factors, whether laid on top of this biological uh, basis or on their own, are important. This is uh, a paper by a colleague of mine at Liverpool, Ben Barr. Um, the data clusters are quite dirty because they refer to um, suicides, uh, people taking their own lives. The uh, straight line, the correlation of it, is the relationship between the percentage increase in unemployment in a geographical area and the percentage increase in the suicide rates over the period of the Great Recession in the UK between 2008 and 2014. And the point is that there's a very clear statistical relationship. It's not 100%. But there's a very clear statistical relationship between social factors and, in this case, suicide, serious mental health problems. Ben, uh, sometimes with, with me as a co-author, has produced other papers on links with people presenting with mental health problems, being people being treated for mental health problems, and other social factors. There's very clear evidence that social factors are related to mental health problems. Uh, my point as a psychologist, incidentally, is I would argue the same issues, which is that I don't think poverty makes people depressed. I don't think even that abusive experiences in childhood cause personality disorder. I think that what these things do is they impact on the way in which we make sense of the world and impact on how we are thinking about ourselves, about other people, about the world and the future. So if you're threatened with the loss of your job, it, it doesn't cause you to be depressed. What it does is it causes you to doubt that you're going to be able to provide for your family, doubt that you're going to be successful in life, doubt that the things that you had as ambitions for yourself may well come out to be, turn out to be true. And that is a very depressing uh, set of conclusions. And if you are, of course, subject to racism or abused as a child, it changes the way that you make sense of the world, it changes the way that you think about yourself and other people. So even when it comes to psychological and social factors, I think that it's uh, a complex relationship between the causal factors and the outcome. So my point from all of this, I guess, is of, of course I would say that mental health problems are fundamentally social and psychological issues. I'm not suggesting that therefore the brain is unimportant. I'm suggesting the brain is the mechanism with which people make sense of their world. And that things that affect the functioning of the brain will of course affect the way in which we make sense of the world, as will the events that happen to us, the way that we're brought up by our parents, the, the peers that we live with, and the way in which we're educated. But fundamentally, I think that our beliefs, our emotions, our behaviours, those things that we call mental health, are the product of the way that we've learned to make sense of the world. So mental health problems are fundamentally uh, social and psychological issues. And because of that, I think it follows logically that well, I don't think we should use diagnoses. I don't think we should separate out one particular way of understanding uh, the world and the emotional consequences from other ways of understanding the world. I believe... I don't believe that there is something called abnormal psychology. I, I write in my book that if I were to crash my car, then hopefully crash investigators would come and they'd apply physics to my car and they'd look at the coefficient of friction between the tyres and the road. They'd look at the wear on the tyres and they'd try to calculate the speed with which I was going, the speed with which the other driver was going. They'd look at where the braking started and stopped and they'd use actually quite straightforward equations to work out how fast I was going at the time of the crash. They'd use physics. But what wouldn't happen is when they went to a road 
a court to decide who was liable, they wouldn't be held up by the judge as using the wrong type of physics. That there was a branch of physics called abnormal physics that applied to road crashes. That the coefficients of physics for road crashes is abnormal physics, and you shouldn't apply normal physics to that situation. There is just physics. And I think that's true for psychology too. I think there's just psychology. There's how people control their emotions, understand their world, make sense of who they are, uh, think about the future. So for me, I don't make a distinction between uh, problems and, uh, and disorders and other forms of psychology. I have to say again, I think that, that I'm not alone here. Uh, this, uh, my colleague Mark Gabe is a GP, came into my office one day and uh, threw this copy of the BMJ on, onto my desk, so I, I tore off the cover and framed it, so it's framed in my office. Now, admittedly, the BMJ put a question mark at the end of it, but I think it's pretty clear that when DSM-5 was, was produced, the idea of continuing to understand our emotional lives in terms of an increasing number of diagnostic labels was starting to wear a little bit thin, uh, even with GPs, certainly with doctors. Um, uh, just note in parenthesis that I've got a PhD student looking at uh, uh, the issue of diagnosis at the moment. She's interviewing psychologists, psychiatrists, service users, and general practitioners about their use of diagnosis. And I don't think it's breaking any sort of scientific confidences to say that what tends to happen is the psychiatrists say, yeah, I realize that diagnoses are controversial, but we find them quite useful. We don't think that they're really real, but we find them useful. The psychologists tend to say, yeah, yeah, and I know who your supervisor is. Yeah, diagnosis is a bit dodgy, but we don't really have any alternative, which I think is wrong. Um, the service users are confused, and the GPs just simply say, diagnosis? Yeah, don't bother with them. And they go, but what do you do? And, she goes, and the GPs just go, well, I'll write a letter asking for a service. And they go, yeah, but surely you need a diagnosis. And the GPs go, yeah, we don't bother with them. And they go, and when you're asked for a diagnosis, what do you do? And the GP goes, we just ignore it. Uh, the GPs are very confident to just not bothering with diagnosis at all. Uh, now, partly because they're making the referral to services, and we're coming on to that in a minute. But uh, doctors are getting a bit fed up with psychiatric diagnoses for various reasons. Um, this, however, is my, uh, my claim to fame, where, where I think that, that uh, uh, there's probably some proof that we're going with the flow of public discussion rather than against it. This is from uh, episode uh, 12 of series 25 of The Simpsons. And of course, The Simpsons is the arbiter of, of cultural understanding in the, in the whole world. And now, those of you of a certain age, which is very slightly older than me, will recognize that, that Diggs, the, the eponymous uh, hero of the episode, is voiced by Daniel Radcliffe and is clearly English. And Diggs, of course, has a kestrel on his arm. So those of you who know about the film Kez, and set in the north, all that sort of stuff. We'll get the, the links. It doesn't explain in The Simpsons why he's got the Kestrel. He just wanders around with the Kestrel, which I think is quite cute. Um, and because he's crazy, Bart falls in love with him. Uh, Bart, Bart thinks that he's wonderful because he's bonkers. And uh, uh, at one point, when they both get expelled from school, uh, Bart asks Diggs uh, whether he is, in fact, uh, clinically insane. And Diggs replies, the rumors of my bonkertude have been greatly exaggerated. DSM-5 indicates paranoid schizophrenia, but that work is mired in controversy, mired. And I thought, Anne Cook sent me this, and I thought, well, yeah, then we've, we've, we've won. I mean, we're not going to get people to stop using diagnoses overnight. We're not going to have a boycott on the use of DSM-5. But if people realize that it's a flawed attempt, then I think that we're, we're onto something. So Anne and I think, yeah, we're probably winning. And certainly there's a, a general feeling that the concept of diagnosis and mental health can at least be questioned. There was a tweet this morning, in fact, about whether people should have to give informed consent before they get a diagnosis, which would be wonderful, and we can ex expand on that a little bit. Um, you get given a diagnosis, so somebody diagnoses you with borderline personality disorder, it has in unimaginable consequences for your career. So maybe you should have informed consent before accepting going to go down that route. Um, Another example, this is, I just put up this slide because I was at a, I was an attendee rather than taking part in a, what they called a fireside chat in America by an organization called Give an Hour, which is equivalent to Help for Heroes. And the New York Times, uh, sorry, not New York Times, Time Magazine columnist Joe Klein uh, was talking about his admiration for uh, veterans who'd served in war and uh, how uh, upset he was that they came back scarred by their experience and started talking about PTSD. And then he stopped and said, actually, he goes, I've stopped using the phrase PTSD 
it, there's clearly post-traumatic stress. People go out to battle and they're clearly stressed by the experience. It's clearly traumatic. There is clearly post-traumatic stress. But it's just a myth to suggest it's a disorder. These people are not disordered. They're just coming back scarred by war. And you just think, perfect. Again, perfect. That's exactly the case. And one of the phenomena th that you notice is just attaching the word disorder to things. So at this moment in time, I have a certain degree of social anxiety. And social anxiety exists and I'm currently experiencing it. Do I have social anxiety disorder? Why add the word disorder to it? Post-traumatic stress clearly exists. Some people experience post-traumatic stress, other people don't. But to call it a disorder has certain implications. And then you take it further, because one of the arguments made in psychiatry is that we need the word disorder to indicate uh, when people are in, uh, in need of medical intervention. Which makes me think that if I go to the GP with a hacking cough, and the GP goes, I've got some very serious uh, news for you, Peter. You have tuberculosis disorder. I say, hang on a minute, why, why have you suddenly called it tuberculosis disorder? They go, oh, well, we need to add the word disorder to our labels in order to point out. And you just think, this is crazy. This is, this is just a crazy world that we live in. So if you're aping the medical approach, ape the medical approach and just say, what you have is an infection of the tuberculosis bacillus. You have a fracture. You don't have fractured femur disorder. There's something sociological about adding the word disorder, and I think there would be something sociological about taking it out. And I thought I'd just uh, uh, refer to, uh, in reference, I suppose, to um, blogging done by uh, uh, Big Phil Hickey in the States. Um, but this is just, I thought I'd put my, my quote in about what I think. So I don't think grief is a, uh, an illness. I think grief is the price that we pay for love. I think that war is traumatic, and em traumatically emotional memories encoded in our minds, uh, our minds in ways that cause very understandable problems in the future. But it's not a disorder to remain distressed by bereavement after three months, or to be so traumatized by the experience of industrialized military conflict that you come back with uh, a stressed reaction. I, I don't think it's a disorder. I don't think we should diagnose people with disorder. I think we should understand what they're experiencing. And I think when you come on to look at uh, uh, ADHD, which is very much your issue, I think it's worth pointing out what DSM-5 says about ADHD, which is there's a pattern of behaviour present in multiple settings that can result in performance issues. And these symptoms supposedly include behaviours like, and I think it's worth highlighting, a failure to pay close attention to details, difficulty organising tasks and activities, excessive talking, fidgeting, or an inability to remain seated in appropriate situations. Um, when I tweeted this two days ago, somebody pointed out that she thought that maybe I was running through a list of diagnoses that I might personally attract. Um, I attract an awful lot more diagnoses than ADHD. Um, Bill Phil Big Phil Hickey, uh, blogging in the States, uh, points out that those are pretty much a definition of childhood. And he asked, what five-year-old is good at playing close attention to details, is good at organizing tasks and activities, uh, is good at keeping quiet, doesn't fidget, and remains seated in all appropriate situations. It just doesn't happen. Um, what I've said about it is, again, trying to normalize this situation. Our children need to learn how to manage their emotions, to attend to their studies sufficiently to learn, and to grow up with a sense of moral and social responsibility. It's undeniably a problem for children, for their parents, for teachers, and for society when that goes wrong. We need to order, offer help, uh, but it isn't an illness. And of course, part of the what's going wrong is all sorts of things, maybe the way in which uh, schooling is structured, the way in which education is organized, the way in which classes uh, are, are structured, the way in which we deal with uh, children's natural rhythms of the day, uh, uh, their attention spans and so forth. I think that there are clear problems uh, when uh, children have difficulty engaging with school, but I'm not sure that the problem is solved by saying that it's an illness possessed by the children which requires treating. I think we need to be more intelligent about it and, to be honest, more scientific. So all of that is about diagnosis, and I think it follows from the idea that what we're talking about is people making the best sense they can of the world and the emotional and behavioral consequences that follow. Uh, for me, it, it logically whoops, follows that we should uh, avoid as much as possible the use of medication. Again, I plead in support uh, Patricia Hewitt on this account. This press release is actually extremely difficult to find. Uh, it does exist in government archives, but you have to go through various firewalls in order to get it, possibly because they used the word Prozac in the title and possibly because it's a little bit controversial. But back in 2006, when Patricia Hewitt announced the beginnings of what's now the IAPT program, Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, the, uh, the, the title of the government's press release was More Counselling, More Therapy, Less Medication to Treat Depression. 
Uh, one of the other reasons why it's hidden is that's possibly an embarrassment for government because the amount of antidepressant prescriptions over the past few years has gone up very significantly. Interestingly, just about paralleling the fall in uh, economic production by the UK. As we've entered into recession, people have started taking antidepressants. There's an obvious parallel. But my point is that the idea that we should reduce our reliance on medication to fix uh, uh, social, what are social and psychological problems, I, I think is shared by other people than myself. So we, what do we do instead? Well, instead, I think we need to rely on the skills of psychologists, to be honest. Uh, psychologists, social workers, uh, educationalists. We need to understand how people have learned to make sense of the world and we need to tailor help to their unique and complex needs. In psychological terms that means uh, making formulations. When the clicker works. So I think this is about a package of care put together by people, by uh, professionals, to reflect each person's unique set of problems. That's different, I think, from a diagnosis treat model. It is, in fact, what many of our medical colleagues do as well. Uh, my point there is simply that's good. I'm glad that they're using an approach which is more suited to people's needs, but I think it follows from a formulation-driven approach rather than a diagnostic uh, driven approach and we can decide what sort of therapy or therapies or what sort of interventions either for the person or for the the system uh, are called for uh, depending on the uh, our analysis of the situation and the evidence uh, that relates to those sorts of problems and again that's different uh, from making a diagnosis and I think for clinical psychology and I think you can can read educational psychology into this too I think that that has consequences I think for too long probably for the past 50 years, since clinical psychology is now 50 years old, uh, we've seen ourselves, I think, too much as, uh, in a sense, uh, social uh, psychiatrists, uh, diagnosing people's problems and then treating those problems with the sort of ersatz pill of cognitive behaviour therapy. And I think we, might, we should have a much broader, uh, more inclusive, as Dave would put it, uh, vision. Uh, I think we need to talk to employment advisors and occupational health services for adults. I think we need to work with schools and children, uh, not only in helping children learn, but also uh, uh, trying to understand how people deal with emotional issues. I think we need to work both more closely and differently uh, with physical health services. Uh, the point being that we as psychologists need to embrace the consequences of a psychological model as much as other people need to. And I think that certainly speaking at clinical psychology, I think that we've uh, aped psychiatry by relying on a diagnostic entry point for our services, uh, identifying people as being disordered by virtue of them having disorders, and then putting therapy to that person. Whereas I think the causes of people's uh, distress uh, more often lie outside of the person, and the solutions to people's distress is not necessarily by treating them, but by helping them come up with solutions which uh, look outside of the individual, I think. Oops. I'll just go back a step. For clinical psychology in particular, and I think it's less common, uh, uh, hopefully, for children, I think we need to think about how we structure care when people uh, are unable to make decisions for themselves. Uh, my argument is that, first of all, I think that people do have extremely serious problems, and when people are in great distress, uh, when people are at risk of harming themselves or harming other people, I think we need to respond to that need. But I don't see why the idea that people are in such distress that we need to intervene, even intervene against their express will, is necessarily the same as people being ill. I don't believe in a disease model of psychiatry, and I don't believe, therefore, that people are ill and require care in hospital wards. We need a different model of care. And the idea that we can have secure residential units uh, which aren't hospital wards, I think, is kind of obvious. Um, in fact, we can see it even in uh, quite modern psychiatry. I'm particularly taken by the uh, example of what's called the Parachute Project in New York. So this is working off the open dialogue approach for psychosis in New York, in the borough of Queens. They've put a very great deal of American money into developing uh, the Parachute Project. So these are residential units staffed mainly by peer support workers, so people who have themselves experienced mental health problems, uh, working as uh, uh, 
um, social, in a sense, residential social workers. When people are in crisis, when people are picked up on the streets, either by healthcare professionals or by the police and taken to the hospital emergency rooms, the people in the emergency rooms have a choice of referring either to traditional psychiatry hospitals or calling the parachute project to come and look after people. They have a two-hour turnaround time, which is pretty much an emergency turnaround time, and people are taken to secure residential units where their needs are met. You can have input from psychiatry, you can have input from nursing, you can have input from therapists, and these places can be safe, but they're not wards. And of course, when things get extremely serious, people need occasionally uh, to receive help when they themselves are refusing help. And I, I'm not somebody who thinks that uh, something like the Mental Health Act is, is unnecessary. But at the moment, the way in which services are organized are predicated on the idea that if you meet the criteria for having a mental disorder, then people can treat that disorder. And I think that we should have a subtle but important rethink about the criteria on which we deliver that sort of care, whereby if somebody is able to make decisions for themselves, I believe that their uh, choices should be acknowledged. I do recognize, however, that sometimes people are so distressed that they're not able to make valid decisions for themselves. And in that uh, case, when people are incapable of making decisions for themselves, I don't only think that we've got a right, I actually think we've got a duty to make decisions uh, in their best interests, even if they're expressing a different point of view. My point is that that should be based on two important issues which are not present in the law at the moment. The first is that uh, people should lack capacity before we intervene rather than have an illness before we intervene. And secondly, that decisions should be made in a person's best interests rather than people should be treated in order to cure their underlying illness. And I think both of those decisions would uh, quite subtly but importantly change the way that uh, the, the uh, compulsory mental health care system worked. And then finally, and in some ways this is probably the most important thing, um, it's something which I think is important because it often gets missed from uh, uh, bi biomedical uh, disease models of healthcare. I think we look, have to look at the social prerequisites for genuine mental health and well-being. Uh, Anne Cook describes this as uh, uh, mopping the floor but leaving the tap still running. And the point is we need to address some of the issues that uh, lead people to become distressed in the first place. Uh, and again, my, when I get the machine working, I think to, in order to promote genuine mental health and well-being, we need to look uh, to psychological issues which are not medical issues. So we need to uh, protect and promote universal human rights. We know that neglect and rejection, abuse, we know that poverty, racism and child abuse are uh, hugely important in the way that people develop uh, emotional problems. And personally, I think that we are neglecting the role of bullying, especially bullying uh, amongst peers and at school in developing your sense of self. If you're growing up, I mean, one of the things that people talk about when they write books is it's kind of curiously acceptable to think, you know, the kid at school dreading going home because what's going to happen when they go home. But you need to think about a kid who's dreading going to school because for 13 years of their life what happens is people tell them they're a piece of shit and it happens every day and they know it. Anyway, if we're serious about addressing mental health problems, I think that what we need to do is to move away from taking people who are in a state of emotional and psychological distress as a result of the things that have happened to them, tell them that they are, are ill in some way and try to treat them and we need to move, to move more towards uh, creating a more humane society uh, where we need to look at poverty, especially childhood poverty, uh, financial and social inequalities, and as I say, uh, the sort of everyday experiences of uh, 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 physical, sexual and emotional abuse. Uh, yeah, I've said enough about that. So there you go. So that's the, uh, there's two other things to say. That's the manifesto. My point is, as I hope I've kind of inelegantly pointed out. I think that, that I regard mental health problems as fundamentally social and psychological issues. I'm not denying the role of the brain in thinking it would be ludicrous, but I'm taking at face value people like Kandel when they say everything that happens psychologically has to involve the brain, but it's everything that happens psychologically involves the brain. The brain is the organ with which we learn to make sense of the world. Some of us do have brains that are probably biologically different from others. 
but I personally think that biological differences between us are trivial compared to the social factors, the learning factors, the environmental factors that impinge on how we make sense of who we are and how we understand our place in the world. Because of that, because I see mental health problems as fundamentally social and psychological, I think we should replace our reliance on diagnosis with straightforward descriptions of people's problems. We should radically reduce the use of medication and use it pragmatically when we do. And instead we need to learn, we need to understand how each person has learned to make sense of their world and tailor help, which would include systemic interventions as well as therapy for the individual on the needs. I think we need to base our system of coercive care on the question of whether people are able to make decisions for themselves. And if they're not, able to make decisions for themselves. I think we need to make decisions in people's best interests rather than to think that we're treating underlying illnesses. And beyond that, as I say, we need to establish the social prerequisites for genuine mental health and well-being. And I'm going to finish with two, because I like these things, I'm a kind of child of Twitter, really, uh, with two quotes that I think uh, sum up the perspective that I'm trying, neither of them are from, from me, incidentally. So the first is uh, this, this is uh, Mirabai Swingler, who works in North East London. She's a, an NHS chaplain. And this is really only on Twitter. It's a Twitter campaign called Only Us, which I really like. So she starts off with the myth that there's them and there's us, that we are well and happy and safe and they are mentally ill and dangerous. And she asks, is this really true? Or is the uncomfortable truth that there's a continuum a scale along which we all slide back and forth during our lives, sometimes happy, occasionally depressed or very anxious, mostly well balanced but with moody moments, usually in touch with reality but at times detached or even psychotic. When we separate ourselves and imagine humanity divided into two different groups, I'm just going to hesitate in that because I think it's worth talking about things like uh, um, criminality, including the, the rash of gun crime in America, and thinking about this idea of how this fits into the them and us and how important it is for me to think that not only when we're talking about political violence, but when we're talking about domestic violence, murder, that again, it's still us making sense of the world. So this artificial distinction, when we take a, a spree killing in America of asking, is this person sane or insane? I think is a meaningless question. The question is, why do people do what they do? Uh, uh, if, if any of you are undergraduates and, or think of coming to Liverpool, you should be beware, because this, this is a, an essay title I set for undergraduates, which is, you know, What's the difference between saying, uh, does, is this person depressed, and what's the, etiolo what's the etiology of depression and how would we treat it, versus uh, what makes us happy and how can we achieve happiness? They're two very, very different ways of asking similar questions. And I think the idea of, is this person sane or insane, is a meaningless question. Is this person driven by mental health issues, or is this person essentially sane, is a meaningless question. And that's what Mirabai is talking about here. So we harm ourselves, she says. When we separate ourselves and imagine humanity divided into two different groups, we hurt those labelled as sick, ill, even mad. We allow stigma, prejudice and exclusion to ruin perfectly good and creative lives. We also hurt ourselves because we stress ourselves out with false smiles and expression of our own vulnerabilities. And I would add, we fail to understand things like political, social, domestic violence if we think that there are some people who are mad killers and some people who are normal. I don't think that helps us understand uh, violence within our societies, incidentally. And she finishes up with, there is no them and us, uh, there's only us, which I thought would nicely capture Dave's inclusivity theme. And to pick up on the theme of social causation, and this is my final slide, um, this is from a friend of mine, uh, Jackie Dillon, who writes very movingly about her own experiences in the mental health care system. We were, we were trying to work out what should the slogan to go on the side of a bus be, similar to the National Secular Societies. Um, I'm a great fan of the National Secular Society, and they had a series of bus campaigns that were, there probably is no God, get on with enjoying your life, which fit in nicely on a bus that they drove around London. So we thought, what would we put on a, on a bus? And this is Jackie's quote, and I think it's right. Uh, Don't ask what's wrong with me, ask what's happened to me. And at that point probably late. I should say thank you very much.